Hello, this is uh, Dan Shea with the uh, Veterans for Peace Forum. I want to welcome you to the show. I have uh, two guests, guests for the first half, uh, uh, Jack Herbert and uh, S. Brian Wilson. <laughs> and, uh, and, uh, and then for the second half, we're going to have uh, Jamie Partridge, uh, who will be talking about uh, single payer and, you know, why it's important that veterans should be concerned about the issues of single payer uh, for the rest of uh, uh, our community and a, and a big benefit that's being uh, done here in Portland coming up soon and we'll talk about that uh, in the second half of the show. But right now uh, I kind of want to just introduce our, our guests. Um, um, Jack, I've, we, you and I have met a number of times over the years at, at various events that you've had with uh, Jobs with Justice and uh, 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 Latin American issues. Uh, and just the other night we were at uh, an event uh, where we had two uh, people from the Arab Spring that were speaking right. over at Concordia, Concordia College over there. And when, it, <clears throat> when, you, when we started talking about some of these things, you were telling me that uh, you were a war tax resistor and that right now the IRS is sort of harassing you. And before we get into that a little bit, uh, I want to also... People know, I'm sure, around Portland, uh, Brian Wilson, who is author of Blood on the Tracks. Uh, it's the life and times of Brian Wilson. Uh, it's really his life story. And this book is, uh, is really a resource for people to really want to understand the history of, of uh, activism in this, in this country, anti-war movement, uh, the issues of, of really humanity and, and what drives people to stand up for what's right in this country. Uh, an incredible story. Uh, and Brian has, you know, just come back from uh, uh, a book tour across the East Coast, up, uh, up into Seattle and uh, Columbia, up in uh, uh, Vancouver, mm -hmm. and uh, has just returned uh, recently. And, uh, and I want to thank him for coming out here. I know it's been difficult for you because you've been having some back injuries, uh, back problems. Uh, so it's something that I carry with me for a long time, too. <laughs> Um, <clears throat> so, Jack, tell us a little bit about yourself. I mean, you went to college, you said, in 1964, University of Washington, is that right? Well, <clears throat> I, went, I went to college in the Bay Area. Bay Area. Graduated in 64, then went to grad school at the University of Washington starting then. And so, uh, and I was in physics, and so I had a, and I, so I had a student deferment, and I didn't get drafted. Uh -huh. And... Um, so when, you, yeah. when we're talking about these things, what, what is the sort of motiva motivation? Uh, you said you didn't get drafted, and you're talking about the Vietnam War, I'm yeah, sure. Yeah. And, uh, and were you th consciously thinking about what was going on at the Vietnam War at that time? And Not very much. I was really interested in being a student. Didn't want to be really didn't want to be bothered much by any of this, but, uh, but he kept hearing stuff. And, uh, you know, from my mom or somebody, I got... Uh, some kind of sense of fairness and uh, I mean like when I was in high school I my folks got Time magazine and I read the newspapers and I figured out that my government was in the business of supporting dictatorships mm -hmm. and um, I sure wouldn't have wanted, wanted to live in one of those dictatorships and uh, you know seems like why shouldn't anybody have to live in it you know we should we should not be violating all those great principles we espouse by supporting this kind of stuff. Well, you know, we learn over the years that there's a, uh, a different mode of thought that present in the American government and a lot of the power in the United States that is the out for domination and control. It's something that kind of grows on you if you're paying attention. You gradually learn more and more and more about it. And, uh, you know, if you let yourself put yourself in the other person's place, it, it's wrong. Mm -hmm. It's just uh, really cruel, sadistic. Well, I kind of, and I kind of learned some things as I was going going along. Uh, I mean, I, you joined the the military, uh, uh, Marine Corps. Um, I wasn't particularly thinking that I was. I wasn't a gung ho person or want to do that. But I kind of was in that attitude that you know I didn't <coughs> see much future. I didn't have a high school. I dropped out of high school. Uh, I was thinking about some way that I was going to probably go, you know, get money to go to college at some time in the future. I thought I was going to be drafted anyhow, and I wanted to get the obligation out of the way and uh, get on with my life if I survived. And I knew that was a possibility I might not survive at war. Uh, <clears throat> but I really didn't understand what was going on. 
But I did see something very early in life was uh, not just that our country supported dictators around the world, but in itself was a was an oppressive government. Uh, it began over a period of time as a worker realizing in the job what oppression is, you know. Mm. You began to see uh, that uh, people of color in my neighborhood, uh, we only had one black family down the street and another was a Native American family. And uh, and I remember somebody using the, the N-word talking about the people across the street. I really didn't know what the heck they were talking about, you know. I mean, there were movies and I'd seen, but I never heard this sort of anger and hate that was out there. Mm. And um, and I went back to my mother and said, you know, you know, what what does this mean? And she actually sent me to the room and made me wash my mouth out with soap and s saying, you know, she doesn't uh, that she says, you know, your, your father is Panamanian and that your m grandmother it could be partly black and uh, Hispanic, et cetera. And uh, this is this is wrong. This is derogatory. That's calling you a name, and we won't stand for it. Whether that was, you know, uh, we don't really understand our whole heritage because people come here, they become American. You speak English. My father U.S. Didn't. American. Yeah. <laughs> North American. Uh, USA. That's a very arrogant term uh, to say America because we're talking about right. continents. Right. <laughs> but, actually, but actually that's part of the system of oppression. Is, that is, is right. So whitewash all this other stuff. Say only, only exactly. thing that matters is here. That's right. And, and so you became uh, involved in labor movements too, right? And yeah, where well, did that come from? Uh, well, I guess, uh, well, I guess, well, first I got involved in the peace movement. Okay. And uh, I remember in grad school, you know, when, when the National Guard shot, four, killed four students at Kent State, and then same time, Nixon starts bombing Cambodia. I mean, by that time, most of us say, this war is crazy, you know, we got to, we got to wind it down, and now he starts. Well, that was it. So I was a, 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 the president of the student body at at the University of Washington. Called community meetings out on the lawn. It was summertime. People went out there and they decided what they're going to do. So we just got on the freeway and marched down the freeway downtown as a protest. And another day, day, we marched through the central area, which was a, where black people lived, to try to f support them and you know pick up some people there. So that, but that was the only thing I did for years because I was too busy pursuing what I wanted to do. Mm -hmm. And um, but uh, but I fell in with some Quakers at some point and and really fell at home with them and their values. And uh, <clears throat> and uh, anyhow, when I moved into Portland in 1983 in the fall, heard about a nonviolent civil disobedience training. I knew I had to go to that because I'd had the I've been too busy looking for work when I was living out in Hood River to go attend some vigils they had along the tracks for. Mm -hmm. the, there were trains that carried the missile warheads to the Trident submarine, the nuclear warheads for the submarines in, there on Hood Canal. And so they would have vigils out on the tracks. And I was off looking for work, and, and so I couldn't participate. But I knew it was time to you know, start doing something constructive. And, and I didn't, you know, I, this is my country, and I want to do something about it. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and the. The thing that really, um, I really just hope that more people will, will take that attitude. This is our country. We've got to act together. We've got to take it back and have it be ours. And not just, oh, well, I'm going to, like I was doing all those years, pursuing my thing, and just let whoever's running it run it and complain about it. Mm -hmm. And Brian, when he says, you know, he was <clears throat> getting out there on the tracks, I just, <laughs> you can't help but... Uh, the title of your book, uh, Blood on the Tracks, and uh, you want to tell people what happened and when? And well, um, <clears throat> of course it was a long evolutionary process before I got right. to the tracks, sure. but um, I was in Vietnam in 69. Uh, I was a commander of 40 troops uh, in an Air Force Ranger unit, and it was while I was there that I um, witnessed the after effects of bombings of inhabited fishing villages and uh, lots of bodies, half of whom, more than half of whom were children. That's when I had my really big wake up. Mm -hmm. Something's not right here. Um, so I got involved for about 10 years in domestic justice issues when I got out of the military, uh, criminal, the criminal injustice system, as I called it. Uh, and then um, I started <coughs> reading around 78, 79, what was going on in Nicaragua, El Salvador. I was reading it in The Guardian 
newspaper, newspaper yeah. both the Guardian in London and the Guardian that was then being published in the United States. There was a there was the Guardian newspaper here, not it's completely different, uh, but similar content. And so I got really uh, viscerally agitated about the fact. Oh yeah, another Vietnam. We just this is what we do. We keep doing this. We call people. Communist, Marxist, Leninist, and that's like a, a code word for poor people organizing, and we will then justify repressing them. And so uh, by the mid 80s, I was already going to Central America and witnessing the stuff for myself, and then found out where the weapons were coming from to carry out Reagan's war against the Soviet beachhead of Central America, and, uh, as he called it. Uh, they were coming from the Concord Naval Weapons Station in Concord, California. And so in 1987, a bunch of us went to that base and we started a vigil. And we started blocking munitions trucks and munitions trains. And um, I decided I would start my blocking on September 1st, 87, uh, with a 40-day fast, a water-only fast for 40 days with two other veterans. and. Um, there was a protocol, the trains always stopped, there was a five mile an hour train, a speed limit for the train, and uh, there were 350 armed marines that were always there protecting the train, mm -hmm. and uh, local police were there uh, often, um, because we were there all the time at that base. Uh, and on September 1st, the day I was to begin my my 40-day block, um, the train sped up to 17 miles an hour and ran over me. I, I mean, I, I didn't get out of the way in time. Lost my legs, lost my uh, uh, fractured skull, a plate in my skull. That's uh, very quickly what I led had. to that uh, gory scene that I almost was killed. Um, <clears throat> but I had started in 1983, four years before then, I had started directly confronting the government with my tax refusal. Before you went to? Before I, that, I went to Concord, right. I started my tax refusal in 1983. Uh -huh. I couldn't resist anymore. I was really getting sick uh, to my stomach. Mm -hmm. and, and I didn't put, put it together with paying taxes, but somebody told me, uh, suggested to me that the reason I was taking Maalox which are these white tablets that you take to calm your stomach. Then, you know, the reason you have those stomach cramps is because you're, you don't like paying the taxes to, to kill people. And I hadn't, I hadn't put that together. And uh, when, I, when he put that together, it was a neighbor. I processed that for about a year. That was probably in 82. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And by 83, I had decided to become self-employed uh, get rid of all my property, mm -hmm. all my bank accounts, but accurately report my self-employed income to the IRS mm -hmm. with a note saying why I couldn't send a check along with it. So um, I was a tax refuser. Mm -hmm. I was not messing around. I wasn't trying to delay or ha harass the IRS. I was saying, look, I'm not paying. Mm -hmm. Here I am. I'm the collateral for the tax. And so I, your law says you can, you can take me to court and send me to prison. I know that. Mm -hmm. And so all the cards are in your court. And so for 16 years, actually, I had this battle. It was really not a battle. It was um, um, 16 years in which they came to my house or called me or wrote me letters, sometimes meeting them at their office. Um, and I would say, it's not complicated. I'm following my conscience, and you have to follow the law. Right. And there's a conflict there. And, and you're in charge of resolving that conflict. Uh, so that was happening before um, I went to Central America and before I went to Concord Naval Weapons Station. And um, so, uh, and for some reason, after 16 years, they did not take me to prison, or did not take me into federal court, which would have led to prison. Uh, the statute <coughs> of limitations expired in my case. I was stunned that it expired. There is a? There's a 10-year statute of limitations limitation. from the time, the last time they assessed a liability in your record. And the last time they assessed a liability for me was 1989. Mm -hmm. 
-hmm. So the statute of limitations expired <coughs> in 1999. And I actually called uh, my lawyer the, la the last day of the 10th year mm -hmm. to find out whether, whether they, the IRS had filed in federal court at five o'clock in the afternoon. I, w I was kind of assuming they were gonna do it, mm -hmm. and they didn't. And so I was uh, free and clear of the IRS, and ever since I've had uh, been living on totally uh, tax-free tax income, mm -hmm. IRS, um, Social Security and VA. VA. And, uh, and as a single person, fi or filing singly, I, you're entitled now, I think, to make $9,800 a year without paying taxes. So I can make up to $9,800 a year mm -hmm. on top of my Social Security and VA without even filing. Um, so, um, but you said you said earlier too that I mean, there uh, we want to put up some pictures here too. You you were talking about uh, those pictures in Panama led you to. Well, that just reinforced because I was already doing. You put up a couple of the pictures that Brian was talking about uh, mm -hmm. earlier. Um, yeah, it was this uh, idea of of actually knowing how much how many people we murder and maim every year, that they're like my brothers and sisters. No. The ones that were in the book. Um, okay, I guess we're going to put it up again here. So let me do this. Um, <coughs> that's, it's, you can probably do it yeah, quicker than me. Um, uh, so there's a couple of people out of thousands of people that were injured by the Reagan's countries. I mean, they survived. Uh -huh. uh, 35,000 were killed. Uh, so uh, things, experiences like that, and then uh, going to El Salvador and uh, seeing the, uh, I have dozens of photos of death squad right victims uh, in El Salvador. Um, 75,000 killed in 10 years, by, all funded by the United States. And uh, then when we invaded Panama in 1989, I uh, was in Panama shortly afterwards and got a lot of photographs from the dead Panamanians from the uh, invasion. I mean, these are just experiences that um, are, and it's a repeat are reasons it's why I don't want to pay money. To, and yeah. when the IRS would come to my house, <clears throat> one time they came and they, uh, Eric was one of the Nicaraguans that I had staying with me because I was helping pay for his surgery uh, in San Francisco, Nicaraguan boy. He was with me when uh, the IRS came to my house. Mm -hmm. And I had, I had Eric tell the IRS what happened to him. And he was six years old, by this time knew conversational English. He explained the ambush, 18 people killed out of 22 in the truck. He was one of the survivors. I said to the IRS agent, I said, do you think I would pay money to an organization that would do this to kids? Do you really, do you really think I would do it? Do you think I have no honor? And again, he said, and his name was Kaminsky, he said, we'll see you in court. And I said, don't you what you say every time? And I said, you aren't doing it. Take me to court. I said, this is the reason I can never, I can never cooperate. So you just have to have the, you just have to have the motivation That's to right. say my dignity is more important than my longevity or my being comfortable outside of a jail cell. Well, too. I mean, you you also took yourself off the sort of wage la right. slave slave labor kind of uh, uh, thing where they take. I was a wobbly money. at heart, really. Yes, yeah. There you go. And uh, and Jack, you're in you were in employed. Uh, you right. Were, you were. I hopped right into the mainstream system. So, yeah. yeah. As so we, as we all, most of us do. <laughs> so I got my. Got my uh, retirement program and I've got social security and they can garnish it all I want and take the money back and collect some fines and pen penalties. And, so, and, and the IRS is actively engaged with you. Yeah. Right. yeah. yeah. So, yeah. so what are they saying to you right now? What happened here? Well, in 2008, I, I got sloppy and I, I should have put, taken, decreased my income, taxable income by doing an IRA or something and I didn't. So uh, I ended up owing about $1,000 and uh, so they went change. after that to get that. Well, when I turn, so when I turn in, and I turn in, do a straight tax reform term, and when I send in the forms, I included a note as a courtesy, telling them that I was not going to pay it, 
because I conscientiously objected to supporting my government's war and militarism and all the consequences of that, the immoral consequences. So they, d they uh, then s declared that a frivolous tax return, they, they have a part of their code which um, all these people, can, that, re that it's frivolous if you make an argument that you don't owe the government your tax money for a frivolous reason. Or the second part is, they say the behavior, whatever that is, uh, exhibits, um, I forget the words, but it's uh, a failure to cooperate with the administration of the IRS laws. So like in cool like hand, not paying your taxes. Like Cool Hand Luke. We have a <laughs> failure to communicate here, son. And, and I was honest <laughs> as saying I have total contempt for the whole system, and you can do it with me whatever you want. <laughs> so, so anyway, so they, so they, decide, they decide that little note made it. Uh, and th now, a few years ago, this, the fine for this was $500, but they jumped mm -hmm. it to 5000 so, so I'm now appealing a five thousand dollar fine. But the interesting part of the code is that if you that the first part, there are two requirements, and the first requirement it has to meet is your return has to be missing something that's essential to determining to evaluating the substantial correctness of the self evaluation, which is your calculation the amount of taxes owed, or it has to contain something that, on the face of it, uh, indicates that the that self-assessment is, is substantially incorrect. Mm -hmm. I, I, went to, I went down to the Portland office and talked to the agent and then talked to her manager, and they both agreed. Well, all we can see is that there's this $25.63 that you got, sense that you got in this annuity. And, well, it was something I got from Metropolitan Life that my father had given me when I was a kid, and it paid me that every year. And, and they reported it as a dividend, but it wasn't an 1099 div, it was a 1099R, which made it an annuity. So I had misreported it. So I had to move it from one case. They said, so just correct that. I'm sure that, you know, said, it's no big deal. You know, this would be over if you just, just correct that. And, the, and the, they, should, they should drop this whole matter. That's what the agents thought. Okay. Well, let's, let's talk anyway. a little bit about war tax resistance, you know. Uh, you have a, a little bit of history about it that you can explain? Uh, well, I was, I was going to church, Metanoia Peace Community, United Methodist Church, and we had formed that church. When I came into Portland in 1983, and I knew I had to go, I got to the, went to the civil disobedience training, and then I went out, uh, joined all these people who were protesting against our, our nuclear weapons mm -hmm. and against our uh, abuses of people in, in Central America. And, and so I was active, with, and I got arrested with these people. And a lot of them were members of Sojourners, which is a Christian uh, group uh, of people who are kind of changes citizens. Kind changes citizens. To work to basically... And anyhow, they decided they wanted to form their own church, so we'd have a church that would support us. I was with the Quakers, but they, I couldn't, I don't think very many of them, Multnomah friends meaning, but we loved each other, we had a comfortable time together, but when, when I did this kind of stuff, it says, oh, that's great, we support you. Mm -hmm. No, the only way you support is you get, get out there and you help out. You know, I mean, citizenship is not looking on from the sidelines. And obviously, our, our kind of government depends on us, the citizens, getting engaged and giving our government direction. And in fact, getting together and finding somebody good and pushing them forward as a candidate and electing them. Instead of and this, and then this free enterprise system where any ambitious person can run, whoever raises the most money and satisfies the big money is the one that's probably going to get elected. And they're not going to be working for us. And so, I mean, it's real obvious what, why we're, we have this country, this government, and this economy that is not working for us, that's abusing people, it's because we aren't doing our jobs. And obviously our system of government depends on us doing our jobs. Well, there's, there, there's a couple things here I wanted to ask too, and that is uh, when some people are, are sort of calculating, you know, to, to become a war tax resistor, uh, do they say, well, I, you know, I support uh, Social Security, I support uh, the safety net. So do they calculate a certain amount of money that they <coughs> refuse to pay? And, uh, and how do they figure that calculation? 
Well, that's one way, and Brian's got a little t uh, pie chart here. That yeah, shows that's a definitely one of the popular ways of uh, tax resistance. Mm -hmm. uh, they look at this pie chart and find out how much, uh, what percentage of the spending is going to military or the debts for past wars and so forth. It's about half. It's about half. Mm -hmm. And then they'll put that in an escrow fund. Um, and the uh, escrow fund uh, is then, like the one in Portland, at each year they give that they decide which, uh, which uh, organizations will receive that money. Uh, I decided not to, withhold, not, to, not to do that, but that is definitely a very credible way. My, my way was to be, uh, I just used the money for my own political work. I funded trips to Salvador and Nicaragua by lots of people. That's how I used that money, but I didn't have an escrow account. Mm -hmm. But that's definitely a, a one way. Another way is to, is to live so simple that you don't make more than the taxable income, which is right. very difficult. You have to live in a community of, of sharing. Right. Um, but definitely uh, the most popular way is to not pay half of the tax and give it to a give it to a, an escrow fund that's <coughs> set up to receive tax resistors uh, money that they're putting in that fund that go to a social, socially just cause. And they're still going to have to, they're still almost always going to be caught and have to pay that money to the IRS. And I decided that I no. just couldn't handle and that's giving them anything. That's what you're talking about, the difference between tax refuser and, and tax, tax resistance. Yeah, a okay. refusal. I'm absolutely refusing any yeah. cooperation or any money. Mm -hmm. Where resistance is, you're kind of stalling and playing guerrilla games with the IRS. Uh, all legitimate, <clears throat> but you are almost always going to pay money to the IRS, and you may pay more because of the fines. Oh yeah. yeah. And so I just I couldn't I couldn't I couldn't handle that. Right. It would crush me. So that's why, I, and I tried to figure out for three years, really, before I started, really, in 1980, thinking about this seriously when I was taking a lot of Malax. Um, I tried to figure out a way to do tax refusal or resistance without paying a big penalty. Right. I couldn't, really couldn't find it. So I said, oh, I know. When I figured it out, I just have to be willing to go to jail. Then I'm free. <laughs> But it took me three years to really sort through that. And I talked to a lot of people, ministers, Unitarian ministers, Quakers, uh, theologians, uh, philosophy professors. Nobody was encouraging me to do this. But I was sorting it out with a lot of people mm -hmm. until I finally decided I was going to have to do it my own way. Mm -hmm. and, but then I felt free. Right. And it was right. amazing. It reminds me, you know, I mean, the, just listening to these, uh, these people from the Arab Spring, you know, the, yeah. the idea that, I mean, people don't realize that, I mean, people are afraid not to pay their taxes. They're For, fear, yeah. they're families and homes, all these things. And it's even in this idea, here you have in, in a repressive government where people are being shot on the streets, uh, thrown in and tortured, who finally said that the thing that freed them was getting over the fear. Right. They were willing to put their lives on the line and say no. And, and this is something that's a little bit a part of the occupation movement here in, in the United States. The uh, uh, <clears throat> Occupy Wall Street, Occupy Portland, Occupy uh, various cities around the country and the world, uh, which is people are saying they have had enough of this and it's time for people who want to know, you know, about how to uh, get involved in these things, you know, go to, you know, Occupy uh, Portland. That's one good reason, a uh, resource. Or Occupy Wall Street. There are ways and channels for you to get involved. But there's a there's a great movement. There's also, uh, you know, the churches that you're talking about, the Mennonite churches, the Quakers. Um, you can go to uh, Brian Wilson's uh, uh, website. <laughs> you want to take, give him your website? Yeah, my website is uh, brianwilson with two L's dot com. And, uh, you know, you can read this history and find out more about his book. You can uh, email him. Uh, he also is on Facebook. Uh, this, you can pick up this book. This is War Resisters League. Uh, they put out this great manual on war tax resistance that tells you all the options in the history. Uh, it's just called War Tax Resistance. This is War Resistors League. Um, 
It's a great resource yeah. um, um, that's available for whoever wants to explore it. I mean, you know, I explored it for years before I actually had the courage to do it. <laughs> and when I did it, oh, it was easy. Uh, once you're willing to pay the price that they're, they're, they can exact on you, and then you, your conscience is clear. That's, that was the amazing thing I learned was when I got over the fear of a consequence, I was free. Right. Mm. That's right. And I know the fear of death in the West really keeps a lot of us uh, in line. Uh, fear of, in, like, I think it was King that said, uh, once you overcome the fear of death, you're free. Mm -hmm. It's you know, true. There's, there's something, too. I mean, I'm with Veterans for Peace. This program is a you know, the, uh, <coughs> Veterans for Peace Forum. And uh, one of the things that uh, just recently we had, you know, I wanted you to say something because you really know this. So we had uh, a, f a good friend of ours, Mike Hasty, and, uh, of course, there's... Uh, my Elliot Adams and uh, was it Tarek Tarek Kauf, Kauf uh, uh, who had gone to uh, South Korea? You want to talk a, just a brief, just give him a little history. Oh well, of that. uh, that's some, a whole other story. But, but um, just a quick. Uh, the United States is pressuring Korea to build this uh, new uh, deep water port in Jeju Island, which is 70 miles south of South Korea. I mean, it's part of South Korea, but right. it's it's an, a big island. It's 30 feet, 30 miles wide by 70 miles long. Okay. And the people there are tenaciously resisting it is to host uh, Asia, Asia's AEGIS missile equipped destroyers as part of the encirclement of China. Mm -hmm. And they recently, Mike Hasty from Portland and T Tarek Kauf and Elliot Adams from, all three from Veterans for Peace, mm -hmm. went to Jeju <coughs> to at request. Uh, at the request of these people and to observe and to to participate in their resistance, and um, of course, we weren't secret. They were not secretive about this trip, and um, they were intercepted before they could get to Jeju Island by Korean National Police, and returned. Deported. Deported. <laughs> Mike was uh, coming from Seoul. The other two were coming from um, Shanghai. Fr from Shanghai in China. And uh, Mike uh, Hasty never got out of the Seoul airport. He was actually put in detention at the Seoul airport for six hours, waiting until for his return flight to the States. Um, Tarek and, um, and Elliot actually got to the Jeju airport where they were greeted by the Korean National Police at the airport with their photographs and forced back on the plane. So um, that's part of the new Veterans for Peace a uh, project called Veterans Peace Teams, Teams, which are going to be trained in nonviolence to go to uh, interface between demonstrators and police. That's right. And, um, they, in fact, they were going to be in New York today, actually. That's right. And I, I, I say, too, I just was reading a little headline here, um, uh, a call against arms of South Korea, the, the little island, Jeju. Jeju, yeah. Jeju is... Uh, called the Island of Peace. And that was named by a former president of Korea. Is that right? Uh, it it's also uh, has uh, nine designations from UNESCO for certain uh, historic and, and biodiverse, biodiverse sites. Biodiversity sites, yeah. Um, and it's also the largest, highest mountain in Korea. It's a, it's a crater, crater island. I mean, it's a volcanic island. Right. Um, and in 1948, there was a there was uh, thirty thousand people in Jeju murdered by uh, U.S. forces working with Syngman Rhee when the South Koreans didn't want to be occupied by the United States and didn't want the United States puppet to be Syngman Rhee to be right. running. And so these people have paid a lot of dear prices for their uh, to maintain their their sovereignty on that island, and uh, now they're dealing with this huge huge deep water port that's under construction right. this year. Uh, now they're using explosive demolitions to, to blow up all these rocks to get the depth in the harbor and uh, there's people getting arrested every day. That's right. Well, I, I want to thank you for just giving a brief little history there. We're going to come into the end of this part of the program and, and uh, we're going to have our next guest on. Uh, I want to thank uh, both of you for coming on and talking about there. Are there any last words you might want to say about 
this or any contact information you want to give them, Jack? Or? No, um, I just I would just encourage people to to really look into their consciences and look at the reality of what what they know, what which direction our government, our role, and power in our country is going, and choose to get involved to work for to have a country that's humane, that's run by citizens who care about each other and other people, that's run uh, ethically, and we can all do that. There are plenty of organizations like Jobs with Justice and Veterans of Peace, lots of organizations around it, and you don't have to start with war tax resistance or refusal. You, you just you get involved with others, and then you fi start finding out what the truth is, and and then you then you can find your way. But get a, join up with other people. Good advice. The meaning of life is found in your heart. Thank you both. Okay. And we're just going to do a little roll into a, a tape here, and uh, we'll get our new next guest on. The healthcare blues. I'm helping out with the planning of the Inner City Blues Festival, April 14, 2012, at the Melody Ballroom in Portland, Oregon. The doors open at 6:30. We're there to create a buzz and to help get the word out about the single payer campaign in Oregon. We want you to drop in and help us all cure the healthcare blues. <laughs> Norman Sylvester, and I, I just wanted to uh, set, put this up here, see if you can see that at all. Um, this is going to be the Inner City Blues Festival uh, that's coming up here. What's the date again? April 14th. April 14th. Yes. On a Saturday night? Saturday night, night. April 14th. And our guest tonight is uh, Jamie Partridge, and uh, I asked him to come on here to talk a little bit about uh, the single, it's a benefit for the single-payer movement. Yes, and, Oregon single-payer campaign. And you are with uh, Jobs with Justice. Uh, I have been a letter carrier and a union activist for That's right. how many years now? Letter carrier for 27 years. Yes. Founder of Jobs with Justice 20 years ago. Oh. Member of the health care committee of Jobs with Justice. Justice. And been a single-payer activist for a mm, decade or so. And uh, you also do uh, KBU radio, uh, labor radio, uh, I do. on the fourth uh, Monday of the month. Is that right? That's right. So you're having a program tomorrow. Monday. Monday. Yeah. Monday. Yeah. 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 That's yeah. right. So it's coming up soon. And uh, so, you, what time do they people call in? Uh, I mean, uh, listen in to hear that. Oh, program. that's six six to six thirty, ninety point seven FM, uh -huh. KBOO, labor radio. This week, uh, I've got the uh, got interviews from the teachers rally out in Gresham mm -hmm. High School last Tuesday. There were a thousand teachers in Gresham, Gresham High School gym mm -hmm. looking for a fair contract. In three districts, they're likely to go on strike. Thirteen hundred teachers. Wow. Yeah. So listen in. Ninety point seven FM. Good. Six good. o'clock Monday. And uh, you know, one of the, you, you've also been an activist with the Portland Central American Solidarity Committee. 
Uh, we were just talking to Brian about what was going down down in Latin America during the 80s, and and uh, you and I both have been down to Venezuela at the same time. There was that 2006, I believe it was That's right. over there. The yes. World Social Forum, yep. and you were meeting with uh, letter carriers down there, postal workers, yeah. And, uh, so it was, it's it's a long history of activism, and what I see here is this real need in our country to become, you know, we see what's happening in other countries, and it's good to burn the candle at both ends so we can meet in the middle somewhere and destroy <laughs> all this stuff. Uh, but people will constantly ask me why you you know care about what's going on there. Uh, we got problems that are right here. Well, you got to look at everything because it's, we're a global economy. Mm -hmm. We're a global world in which people are suffering and they whip uh, <clears throat> people uh, from one one angle or the other. They actually divide people and separate people and alienate them mm -hmm. and make them enemies of each other mm -hmm. in order to control their economic uh, resources. And it seems to me when we're talking about a crime uh, to pay taxes to uh, war, it's also a crime uh, not to pay, you know, not to, to 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 make profit off of people's illnesses. Yeah. Um, and what I, you know, we I have veterans for people. I mean, as I mean, I have the VA. I'm as a veteran. I have a, a disability rating with the VA, mm -hmm. and I can go there to the hospital. Why should veterans care about uh, a single payer system? <laughs> well, veterans have socialized medicine, That's right. which is actually not the same as a single payer. Uh, socialized medicine is where the government pays the doctors and, and um, owns the hospitals. That's the VA system. Mm -hmm. that, the Indian health care system is the same. Uh, the British health care system is that way. A single payer system is publicly funded but privately provided. That is, uh, all the funds come through the government and but pay. Uh, you can go to any doctor, go to any hospital. Uh, that's the Canadian system, that's the European system, uh, Japanese system, all the industrial countries, except the United States, which has a privatized system and multiples of private insurance payers. Um, these other countries have been using a single payer system for decades and have proven that it costs half as much mm -hmm. And provides better outcomes. The, all these other countries have lower infant mortality rates, uh, longer life expectancies. The uh, United States has like, is like 47th uh, in the world in, uh, in terms of medical outcomes, but it spends more than any other country on medical care. And that's because the private insurance system uh, sucks out 30 percent of the, of the health care dollars through uh, profit. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, dividends to, stock, to stockholders and, and, and high, high CEO salaries and marketing and I mean, there's all this advertising that goes and then pull pharmaceutical of course, companies. Uh, well, <laughs> yeah, and I mean, it's not just the insurance companies, of course, um, administrative costs, but just just taking the private insurance companies out of the equation would save 350 billion dollars in this country, mm -hmm. and. Um, we could cover all the people that are uninsured, and still pay and still pay less mm -hmm. for health care in this country. There are there are over 50 million people that are uninsured in this country. Plus, there's all these people, 30 million people who are underinsured, folks mm -hmm. who, you know, have these high deductibles, um, where they essentially can't afford to go to the doctor, even though they're insured. Um, and we could cover all those people with full comprehensive. Um, because of the additional cost that, that the private insurance insurance causes in, in in our system. So why? I mean, if it's going to save the government, I mean, uh, us money, the taxpayer money, um, and I mean, for years people have been talking about this. I mean, I, I can remember when I was very young, people were talking about it. Of course. It was always denigrated. Oh, it's that socialist, socialized medicine, uh, mm -hmm. and you hear it over and over. Of course, now Obama uh, is a um, not only a socialist, just not, but very subversive in this socialism uh, as a dictator that's going to dictate. Well, you know, Obama, when mm -hmm. he was, even when he was running for president, was asked if he would support a single payer. Right. You know, um, government funded, privately provided system, and he said, if we could start over again. That's what we should have, is a single-payer system. What Obamacare is, um, 
is basically a big uh, subsidy to the private insurance companies. Right. It's, it's, it's putting more tax dollars into private insurance, mm -hmm. which is about as wasteful as you can get. Mm -hmm. And um, there are some good things about Obamacare in that, that uh, you know, young people can be on their parents' plans longer, you know, till age 26 instead of age 22. Um, there's it's supposed to be free preventative care, you know, like for mammograms and uh, you know, prostate skin. diseases. Yeah. And, uh, um, but I, I, as I found out it, in, in my private insurance company that, you know, I don't pay anything for preventative care, but they raise the rates on, you know, specialist right. care. Um, there's also, yes, no, there's supposed to be no... Uh, um, pre-existing disease... Uh, refusal as a uh, result of pre-existing conditions, yeah. um, but they can get around that. And, and there's not supposed to be no cap, lifetime time cap on the amount that the private right. insurance company can pay. But the main point about private insurance is, and, and the Obamacare plan is that there's no cost control. Mm -hmm. There's no way that um, these private insurance companies cannot continue to escalate the costs. And as you can see through in the Massachusetts plan, which is what Obamacare is based on, um, there's still the same rate of bankruptcies due to medical costs mm -hmm. as, there, as there always has been. So, um, you know, 60% of uh, bankruptcies in this country are due to medical costs, and will, that will continue. And the only thing that can really control costs is single payer because when everybody's in the same system and the, and, and the government is negotiating with the hospitals, with the doctors, with the pharmaceutical companies, they don't have anywhere else to go. Right. You know, so they have to negotiate, and that's why that's why in the veteran system, the uh, the drugs are forty percent, the pharmaceuticals are forty percent less than in the private market because the the the, fe the single payer system has all these people in, all the veterans in, and they can say to the drug companies, you know, if you want our business, you have to lower the prices, plus and then we'll, that's we'll go out and kick their ass, and, that, <laughs> <laughs> and that's why the Canadian system, you know, they have the drugs in Canada cost half yeah, as much yeah. as they do in the United States because everybody's in the system, and the pharmaceutical companies don't have anywhere else to go. Well, I think too. I mean, uh, one of the things is uh, like. Uh, they're using the term Obamacare, uh, whatever the public option is, you know, uh, these kinds of issues. Well, that, that doesn't they, even exist. They yeah, tried for that. Yeah, but, they, yeah. The, but the, the thing is, is from the very beginning, I mean, this, there's a requirement that everybody be a part of it. And it gives, like you said, to the private companies, they can raise those rates. There's no restrictions on them. And uh, what I see is, again, another transfer of wealth uh, from people. And, and it, it Yeah, from the 99% to the 1%. 1%. Yeah. And these are the things that you know, people are standing up. Uh, uh, Margaret Flowers, who was here a while back, and uh, yes, I sent her and told her we were, that, that this blues festival was coming on and she was going to be there, but she's going to be in Washington, D.C. or something. I've mm -hmm. uh, been mm -hmm. a great advocate for single payer. I've been in the forefront yes. of fighting uh, mm -hmm. uh, for that issue. Uh, an incredible woman uh, and a doctor who... A majority of doctors this. support metal, uh, single payer. Yeah. It didn't used to be that way, but they're, they're understanding now. I mean, this is what happened to my father. My father's a physician. Actually, that's why I'm in this, because of my father. He basically retired because he was... The insurance companies were calling the tune, you know. Mm -hmm. they, were, they were telling him he couldn't uh, order certain tests, that he couldn't provide certain treatments, that he couldn't, you know, spend as much time as he wanted with the patients. And, and he... He dropped out and, jo and joined the single-payer movement and became a chief petitioner for the ballot measure in 2002 in Oregon, which was roundly defeated because the insurance companies put millions of dollars in, unfortunately, to defeating it and calling it, you know, wasteful government spending and all that stuff. But the doctors are, about, you know, doctors see how corrupt the system is, and they're on board with yeah, single-payer. And, and preventive care is so important because we can save so much gas in the future. One of the things that I think... Uh, uh, about veterans that I think people don't understand mm -hmm. is that actually we're dealing with all these returning veterans coming in. Uh, many of them have post-traumatic stress, other issues. Uh, when I first came back, I, w I went to the VA and in the, through the bureaucracy of government, uh, oftentimes I was, uh, I was humiliated and I did not use them for years and years and years and years and was in denial of my own post-traumatic stress. Um, uh, I hear from veterans that I come back that I talk to now saying the same thing, I don't want to go to them, I don't want to be a part of them, they, they screwed me, they screwed me up, uh, you know. And then, uh, then, you know, what we say, you know, there are really good people in there that are doing, really trying to help people, and you need to take care of your, your, your body and your soul and your, everything else. So these, uh, uh, I encourage people to take advantage of it. But there are people in, in rural areas that have to travel 
hundreds of miles to get to a VA hospital. And if we had a single payer system, any veteran anywhere in the country could get care. You yeah, don't at have any to hospital. To, that's right. right. And right. that and I think that's what we need to, to build in this this country is is something that is not just one person has a privilege because of uh, whether you went to war or not mm -hmm. went to war, it's the idea that you should have the right to, everybody should have a right to uh, 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 free medical care. And I think uh, uh, nobody should make any profit off of somebody's illness and suffering. Yeah. Well, and, and, and preventative care lowers the cost. I mean, right now, right. the reason that, one of the reasons medical care is so <laughs> high is because people who are uninsured go to the emergency room, which is the most expensive way to treat. That's right. uh, and, and preventative <clears throat> care is what lowers the costs. And so if it's government run and, and it's democratically controlled, it means that, that clinics should be set up you know, in rural areas and hospitals should be set up in low income neighborhoods so that people can get this kind of care. And, but in, now with the private insurance system, the hospitals are built in the wealthy neighborhoods. The, you know, in my neighborhood in inner northeast Portland, we used to have a hospital, but it's no longer there. Kaiser is now out in Sunnyside. Right. You know, they, they, they're building a new one out in you know, the west uh, Washington County in the, in, the, in the more wealthy suburbs. It's, it's a crazy system, which it's, it's even, there's even less access as years go on, mm -hmm. on to, to people to medical care. Yeah, now I want to say, you know, if people want to get involved, of course, uh, there's a number of different ways. There's sure, certainly coming to the Inner City Blues Festival. Inner City Blues Festival is a great uh, way. And it's a, it's a, it's a, a chance to have some fun. Uh, it's the Absolutely. Inner City F Blues Festival reunion. And I remember back, uh, what was it, when uh, Jesse Jackson was running for president, uh, uh, Ken Cropper and I and uh, the Rainbow Coalition, you and others, um, we began to talk about, you know, this little fundraising thing. And Ken and I would said, well, we thought you know, it'd be a good inner city uh, a blues festival. We could get somebody there. And we had uh, uh, Lloyd Jones, Norman Sylvester. We had, uh, there's another guy, Ralph, I can't remember his last name now. Um, uh, all these great blues people. Uh, and we decided, I remember the Rainbow at the time said, we don't have the funds for that. Ken and I actually hmm. working in for the printing union. We were making pretty good money, union job. I remember. And we put up uh, our cash to pay for the band. And we never really oh, had to pay. Right? Yes. We put up the yeah, cash. Yeah, wow. we put up the cash for the band. Never had to do it because we raised the money. You know, we put yeah. it up up front and, um, and we guaranteed it. Uh, and that bit was the beginning of, of what became the Inner City Blues Festival. Started out as Jam for Jesse. Jesse Jam for Jesse Jackson. And, uh, and then moved on into this, this uh, and here we have again, Norman, uh, Norman Sylvester will be playing. Uh, we're gonna, we have Lloyd Jones, who was there in the very beginning. That's right, that's right. Uh, we have a number of people that are gonna be showing up, uh, uh, Leanne Miller Sylvester and Janice Scroggins. Yeah, they're uh, doing a tribute to Lady Day. That is Billie Holiday. Billie Holiday, yeah. what a great. Um, great combination. It, it's, it's amazing. And it's a, it's a chance to just Boogie out is uh, yeah. uh, well. It's, as it'll be Norman Northwest All Stars. I mean, we got yeah. not only blues artists like Lloyd John Struggle. We're going to have Chad Addy, who's yes. uh, Af doing an African drum uh, procession and performance, and we've got. And he was there at the original too. Was he? Yes, no, I, was, I didn't I remember that. Me that. And, and Shoehorn, which is who's oh, a, yeah. a tap dances and plays the, the saxophone oh. at the same time, and we'll have the Mad as Hell Doctors, which is this crazy group of doctors who is fighting for single payer. They have their own song. They're going to sing it. And then, of course, we'll have Paul Knowles will be the, the uh, master yes. of ceremonies who has, He's been there he had a blues year. club way back. Yeah. You know, he had the, he had Geneva's and jazz and, and um, the Cotton Club. Yes. And now he's the mayor of Northeast Fred Portland. Parks uh, was a, the Cotton Club when we first did the jam. Yeah. And uh, yeah. Paul's been around and uh, he's, he's, Year after year, he's uh, supported the, this movement. And, and then uh, Ray, Ray, Renee, Renee Mitchell is going to uh, fill in also as MC, and she's a former columnist with the Oregonian and uh, okay. fabulous well, spoken I'm, word artist. Go I, ahead. I hate to say it, but we have to wrap up. We just came in there, and we got about three minutes uh, to go here. Okay. Um, where can they get tickets? Well, the easiest way is to go online, uh, www.ticketsoregon.com, and you can uh, pay with a credit card. Or you can go to one of the outlets, uh, the Music Millennium on uh, 31st and Burnside, uh -huh. Geneva's or Reflections. Uh, Geneva's is uh, at, on Martin Luther King at uh, Killingsworth, Killingsworth. And, and Reflections is nearby. Or Patty's Home Plate in, in St. John's. 
And of course, uh, some and, of us have. And I wanted to give you a check. Uh, oh my goodness! Jeff, this is fifty dollars. Is a from Veterans for Peace. Uh, we're we're uh, co-sponsoring uh, endorsement. Fabulous. Ken told me to give you the check. Uh, uh, we accept. So we wanted to make sure we got that. And uh, thank you very much. The, table. the sad thing is, is I, you know, I've been a part of this for so many years, and my wife and I love going out and dancing to mm -hmm. the blues, and. Uh, it's, uh, 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 I won't be here, I have to go to Washington, D.C., so, and it, you know, <clears throat> but if you can be there, <laughs> you people out there can be there. We'd love to have you come to this, become a part of this movement. Uh, check into Veterans for Peace for more information, or go to my uh, email, djshea at hotmail.com, and uh, I'll send you an email with any of the flyers and posts uh, that people can have. So I think that's it for the program, and uh, we'd love to have you come back next month. Uh, we'll do this on the fourth Saturday of every month. This is Dan with Veterans for Peace Forum. Uh, Jamie, thank you for coming out. You've been a great activist all these years, and uh, we're glad to have you around. Thank you, Dan.